Welcome to the NLP View with your host, Donna Blinston. Each week, Donna will explore how the techniques of NLP can help improve your personal and professional life. And now, here's your host, Donna Blinston. Hello and welcome to the NLP View. My name is Donna Blinston. Today's guest is the inspiring Dr. Richard Gray, author of the best-selling book about addictions, Notes from Psychology, Neuroscience and NLP. About Addictions provides a perspective for clear thinking about what to do rather than how to feel about addiction and addiction spectrum disorders. Dr. Richard Gray provides the reader with data from psychology, neuroscience and neurolinguistic programming, NLP, looking at the nature of addictions and the structure of motivations for change. He provides techniques and perspectives from NLP to suggest some novel approaches to treating the problem. NLP allows you to make changes at all levels of the mind, looking at areas that controls your instinctive habits, your beliefs and your behaviours. When the addiction connects to negative thoughts and beliefs from a person's past, for example, NLP can remove the negative associations that have been attached to those memories. If the addiction provides an escape from stress, anxiety, or from an unfulfilled life, then NLP can help set goals that can push aside the need for escaping. So I'd like to welcome to the show Dr. Richard Gray. Hello, Dr. Gray. Hello. How are you, Donna? I am brilliant, thank you. Really good. How are you? Oh, good, 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 good. Thank you. And before I start, I just want to thank you for joining me today on the show. It's a true honor to have you as my guest today. Well, I'm honored to return. This is this is a, a treat for me. Uh, as I said before, I love to talk, and uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't love an audience. <laughs> Well, I mean, as you as you know, and our listeners will know now, that alongside my NLP consultancy, I work as a specialist in bloodborne viruses. So I treat patients with Hep B, Hep C, HIV, and amongst my patient group, a good half of them are XIV drug users with addictive spectrum disorders. So this field that you that you work in and that you've studied and provided the science. Um, a, long, a science to attach to the NLP is just it's so fundamentally important to me, both professionally within my nursing role, but also with my private clients that I coach. It's given me new ways of, of looking at how I can support them, new options, and it's that whole the curiosity around it. And it's, it's not just helped me, but the colleagues that I work with and that I've shared your book with, it's helped develop them professionally. So... I want to just thank you as much as anything else. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And well, before we start discussing your work, could you tell our audience about yourself? Well, uh, right now I'm a, uh, a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Fairleigh Dickinson University uh, in New Jersey in the USA. Uh, before that, for 21 years, I was a United States probation officer uh, in the U.S. courts in Brooklyn, New York. While there, for 10 years, I did nothing but treat uh, substance abusers of various kinds, from uh, casual users to serious addicts. And um, several years into that program, into uh, that job, uh, using NLP skills, uh, I realized that, that we had tools that we could use much more efficiently uh, than the ways the government was then wasting money on treating addictions. And so we created the Brooklyn program. And we ran several hundred people through it, at massive savings of money. Uh, and we got 30% uh, abstinence, 29.6% abstinence after a year uh, after completing the program. And that was with about two hours of my time per week. Uh, so that says something about the effectiveness of NLP. Wow, <laughs> that's a credit to you. How how did you come about um, NLP yourself? Time magazine. <laughs> In the early <laughs> '80s, there was a, an article about Time magazine, uh, rather in, in about NLP in Time magazine, and it, it spoke about a few techniques. One was rapport, and the other was. Uh, uh, talking to the part. And I said, well, let me try this. And I had uh, a client who was connected to the mafia. 
And uh, we had never really talked about anything. And I began doing rapport exactly as it was described in Time magazine, mirroring his posture, mirroring his race. And suddenly he forgets that I'm his probation officer. Yeah. And he starts to talk about how stupid the feds are and <laughs> begins to give me information that nobody had. He walks out. I, I call up the FBI and give them the information. And sure enough, it's accurate. They're able to, to change the nature of their investigation. Uh, another guy came in and just a very sweet man who was an artist. And he had had uh, really a phobic avoidance of uh, art galleries because when his art gallery went sour, he decided the only way he could refinance it was by importing cocaine. And, of course, he got caught. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I was really interested in getting this man to uh, uh, get back into the gallery business because he was a very talented artist. And so I sat him in a corner and I said, you shut up. I want to talk to that part. <laughs> and I began to talk to the part responsible for his not going uh, to uh, working in, in, in the galleries and essentially did a six step reframe without knowing what I was doing. And don't you know, within a month or so, he had gotten a job in a gallery and uh, was adjusting very well. I was convinced from that point. Uh, when I went to take my PhD a few years later, they wanted us to study something besides our main topic. Mine was Jungian theory. And mm -hmm. uh, I chose NLP. I said, here's my excuse. And I took practitioner and master practitioner training. Wow. I, it's, I, I the, the, that experience that you had is um, is very similar to along the lines of mine, and the parts reframe that you talk about is one technique that I use a lot with my clients. But particularly, the it was one of the things that really enabled me to see and feel the power of NLP and um, the respectfulness about it, because you very oh, enables you to get into that other person's world. When I took my my current role within healthcare, I've um, well, if I step back, I've been very much brought up, wrapped up in cotton wool, quite naive to that side of the world. However, my passion and my speciality, which is in the liver and gastroenterology, is what brought me into my the bloodborne viruses role. Ah. With that comes the substance misuse world, which I was completely naive to, and if it weren't for the NLP. I wouldn't be able to build that rapport. I wouldn't be able to respect their model will because it's a model world that's so different from a world that I was brought up in. And seeing that power that it's got and that the grace that, that there is there about it, it yes. and, it's very, it's, very it's powerful. Wonderful. Yes, very. It's, and grace is a wonderful world straight out of Gregory Bateson's idea that when we unleash the power of our unconscious and rest down into grace as trusting our, our own deep selves to lead us in a positive direction. Uh, that's part of the essence, of, I think, of NLP. Uh, I often quote Milton Erickson uh, saying that he would never presume to tell the unconscious what to do. He just tells no. it the direction <laughs> and trusts it. And, uh, yes. I, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, my, a brilliant quote. Oh, it, well, he was a brilliant man, and uh, we would do well to listen more to him. Uh, my interest in addictions, uh, first of all, comes from my own life experience. Uh, I come from a family of alcoholics. I had my own drug problems in the 60s. But uh, when I finished my PhD, uh, I, was, uh, I had been doing a special assignment as the computer guy, and they said, you have to go back to doing regular casework. And they gave me a drug caseload. And I said, well, what do I do with this? I had Jungian theory and I had NLP. And I began to realize that the two fit together. Jung provided a structure about how to think about change and more about transformative change uh, than anything else. And NLP provided a set of tools that I understood that we could use to change people's experience. If you consider that, that one, one of the big pieces of addiction is that it's the best thing that's ever happened to them in their current experience, and it biases their whole nervous system um, so that every other kind of reinforcement or engagement is, is, um, is lessened in its impact. Uh, the first question that came to my mind, how can we give somebody 
a set of experiences that will be intrinsically more valuable, more intuitive, and more accessible than the drugs. And, of course, that comes right out of uh, reframing by a Grinder and Bandler. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's a direct quote from them. And that question stayed with me. And it occurred to me that, that if we could awaken people to a deep sense of their purpose, uh, that would go a long way towards changing uh, their whole connection to the world. And, of course, that also changes the nature of addiction treatment from being an ill-formed, according to NLP Enterprise, uh, to being a well-formed enterprise. And yeah. one of the, the great insights to me from NLP is, is the idea of a well-formed outcome. It must be stated in the positive. It must be under your personal control. It must be sensory specific. It must be ecological. And then you have to be able to step into it and describe how you got there. Well, when we approach drugs, we start off by telling people, don't do that. Yeah. But, but <laughs> that's no way to get to an outcome. Okay? And, and, and by their own experience, uh, not doing drugs is something that they can't do. No. And so there was another groundbreaking piece of information that that I came across from uh, James Prochaska, who with Norcross and De Clementi were the founders of the Stages of Change model. And yeah. I don't know if, yeah, and I know you're aware of it, I don't know if your listeners are, <laughs> but this is one of the most well well used uh, models of change that there is, scientifically mm-hmm. validated. And people pass from what in addictions we used to call denial, uh, and that's just pre-contemplation. They don't even know there's a problem half the time. To contemplation, thinking about a problem, uh, to preparation, to making some kinds of movement towards change, to action, actually doing something about it, and then and then uh, maintenance. And finally, which addictions people don't like to talk about, termination. It's no longer a problem, and the person is no longer connected to it. James Prochaska uh, says in several papers And in the middle of the book, Changing for Good, he says this. He says, one night he awakened and he realized that there was some commonality among all the people who had made significant changes. And he went down and he went through articles and articles and charts and charts. And he said Mm -hmm. this. He said, the one thing that differentiated the people who were successful at change from the people that weren't was this. They had all identified something in their life that was more important to them than drugs, okay, or alcohol, or whatever the change was. The light went on for me. It connected up with the Jungian idea of calling, and I said, my goodness, the well-formed outcome is going to be one of the central pieces in getting people to change. And he also showed this. He said that trying to convince people that it's not good doesn't work. But when they have the outcome, when they know what they want, they immediately begin to devalue the problem behavior because it gets in the way of what they want. It's pure NLP. Prochaska had no idea it was pure NLP, but but that's a crucial piece. Uh, okay. Well-formed outcomes are powerful, and uh, that was really one of the heart uh, pieces of the program. That's the big, the biggest part that I play with my clients when I'm working with them and their addiction is that well-formed outcome side. And half of, the, half of it is because um, the substance misuse problem or behavior that they have is their go-to resource. It's mm-hmm. their way, it's their get-out clause. And the thing is, they've got, that's their strategy for coping with the stresses, the whatever's going on in their life. And every time they turn to drugs, they get the result they want to get. Exactly right. And we're not allowed to say that, are we? We're not no, allowed we're to not. say no, it, we're, that's wrong. it works. It works for them <laughs> it, immediately. It works perfectly. It does. <laughs> and you know, it's that whole essence of NLP of how people do the best with the resources that they've got available to them. Drugs is a resource that's available to them and that they know how to do. And because they've got wrapped up in that world, and it's not just the the, the world of drugs for them as an individual, it, it come it's a whole community of life. It's their their it's their their social their peer group, their friends, their community that they live in. It's the only knowing of being that they're used to. And it's that whole even if you take the drugs away from that person, you're still putting them into back into that same bed sits, it was the same social neighbours and friends, the same problems, the same stresses. And that's one of my issues that I have with healthcare is that 
you know, the like Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, a lot of my work prior to this role was with alcoholics. And a lot of their, you know, we, we bring them into hospital, they withdraw, we do the whole detox with them. We then send them out without the alcohol, which is their identity of self, and put them back into the same home that they were in that caused that had the problems in the first place and tell them to go and self-refer to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they need, they live off that that social reinforcement. They need that that peer group, that social bonding, that group support. And if you've missed it, missed out that step and you've put them back home to where their troubles lie in their world, it's, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, yeah we it don't do that too much. No. The, 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 the other piece of that is that if if we speak to their core, which NLP is capable of doing, and awaken a direction that allows them to discover who they are and what all of their biology and neurology has been calling them to do since the day before they were born, okay? Mm -hmm. If we put them on that track, then what I've seen happening fairly consistently is people waking up in the middle of that and saying, hey, I don't want this anymore. I want a different life. And maybe they get divorced, maybe they move away, uh, but they begin to build a brand new life. And, and that's one of the crucial things. We want to speak to people's hearts to the point where they find out what is best for them. Interesting study. Uh, some years ago in, in Connecticut here in the U.S., uh, the VA did a massive study of alcoholics. They had found that uh, naltrexone worked very well with heroin addicts and had shown great promise in mm -hmm. dealing with uh, alcoholics just by blocking the urge and blocking the, the feeling uh, that comes from drinking. Well, they did this huge study, and as you just said, uh, the people walked back into their environments, and lo and behold, no sooner were they off in the track zone, but they were right back drinking. Why? Yeah. Their whole lives were centered around drinking. They didn't know what else to do, and they no. hadn't dealt with the real problem. No. Yeah. That's, and, that's where a lot of, a lot of well, yeah, your work and... Um, you know, we all work, my work and other people as well, is it's that, those intrinsic personal goals, that identifying with the sense of self, the sense of being, the who are they? And that, you know, it, it's that question as well that you ask of, you know, what would you want, what, what, what would you want to be instead? Who else are you? And they don't know. And yeah. it's, that's a huge big, or, you know, excuse the French, but it's a big slap in the face for some people. Sure. And, Half the time, because nobody's ever asked them, because people aren't interested, because they see them as the alcoholic, as the drug addict. They don't see the person behind, because it's that whole self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? They become what they're stereotyped to be, because sometimes it's just easier to be what they're meant to be, rather than try and work it out for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Pure, pure labeling theory. Uh, stands up and shouts at you from that. I One of the striking things about finding that direction, that developmental path, uh, comes from a story. I I used to be the, the, the probation officer of last resort. Anybody who was too crazy for anybody else to come to, anybody who was too seriously addicted to get any results elsewhere, well, they, they ended up giving it to me. And I, I got this ex-mafia lawyer. That's one of my favorite stories again. Uh, and and this guy was had been a rabid, a rabid, uh, threatening, shouting machine. He came into uh -huh. the office, would disrupt it all the time. Well, finally, he got hooked on coke, had a serious habit. They had sent him to every treatment they could, and they didn't want to put him in jail because they knew lawsuits and trouble would come out of it. So they finally brought him to me. And at that point, the one thing that came to mind, this is along those same lines, uh, Richard Mandler says, ah. And I said, okay. I said, Charlie, what do you need to have in your life in order for this not to be a problem anymore? Yeah. And he said, well, I know, but I can't tell you. <laughs> I said, ah. So we worked <laughs> on it. We used NLP tools. We used meta model and we used uh, reframing and everything else. And after about a month, he says, well, I'll tell you. When I was a kid, when I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a priest in the Catholic Church. I was an mm -hmm. altar boy, and it meant so much to me that I know if I ever went back to church, my life would be changed. And so we began yeah. to meta model that and work with that. And again, after a month, he had been to confession. Another week, and he'd been to the Eucharist. Uh, within another month, he had stopped uh, using 
altogether. And as far as I know, uh, let's see, 19, that was 1996. He has been clean ever since. And this was someone with an uncontrollable cocaine habit. Uh, wow. But but he found the thing that would give his life meaning, and uh, that without imputing any supernatural uh, meaning to that all, it's simply the fact that we all have a core towards mm-hmm. which we're meaning, at moving, and sometimes no one ever asks us, or we no. never stop to think for ourselves, and just a little push sometimes uh, in the right direction, like the butterfly effect, can cascade mm-hmm. into entire life changes. Other times we have to do other things. And um, one of the things that, that we did in the program, uh, part of the way we got to helping people find their outcome, their, their life meaning, was to teach them how to control their emotions. You know, in NLP, one of the things that we do is we do submodality analysis, the small yeah. dimensions of, of sensory experience. How big is it? How bright is it? How close is it? How loud is it? Uh, what's the timbre of the sound? What's the texture of the feeling? Where is the feeling? And I never promised, we never associated our program with addiction. Uh, as soon as people were sent there, we said, this is the last time we're going to talk about addiction and never talked about it again. I promise them three things. We're going to teach you three things in the program. One, how to feel better every day. Two, how to control your emotions. And three, how to turn them on and off whenever you want. And so we taught them how to take a simple memory, Mm -hmm. crank it up by making it bigger, closer, (laughs) louder, okay? And people would jump out of their chairs. Oh, I didn't know I could do this. And then we, we would teach them to anchor that. So that, so that, which is really a basic conditioned response, so they could push a button, they could put their fingers together, and that feeling would come up, and it would change their mood, it would change their attitude, and it would change uh, their whole perception of what was going on. Another favorite story that comes out of that time is I had a guy, he was a multiple bank robber. He had been violated on parole several times. Uh, The guy looked like he was going to spend his career uh, either uh, in jail or on supervision. And uh, (laughs) he was was in the program, and he was skeptical but cooperative. He was a nice guy. And one day he comes to me, I think it was the week after we learned the first two anchors, he came back and he says, Dr. Gray, I've got a problem. I said, what's the matter? (laughs) said well i went i went to the place where i usually buy my drugs and i said yeah he says well i said what happened he said i got confused i didn't know what to do i said so what did you do he said i left we never had another positive you learn from the guy just being able to feel good was enough to turn this person's uh perspective inside out and he began to do very well Anchoring and submodalities are um, personal favourites, personal favourites of mine. And I know with one of the things around anchoring, I had um, only only recently actually a lady that I've been working with for some time and she's um, abstained from drugs, she's doing really well, a hugely intelligent lady, she's just beautiful to see her develop into, you know, into herself. But when mm-hmm. when we first started looking at um, anchoring, how how is it she wanted to feel? She wanted to feel free, and that was a reason uh-huh. why she wanted to feel free from her life stresses, but free from pain. And she had um, a lot of um, spinal problems and um, um, sciatica pains. So we looked at that feeling, and a lot of it was um, the freedom from pain, and that's yeah. what she was chasing with the drugs. So opiates is how she got into drugs, and that led her down the path of um, more addictive heroines and et cetera. So when I worked with her around, we looked at installing an anchor so that she could get that state of freedom, that sense of the higher self is what she was wanting, and that peace and tranquility within herself. And just by having that, once we'd applied it, she just broke down into pieces because she never, ah. she thought she could only ever get that through drugs, and she thought she was going to be a dirty drug addict, which was her model of the world, because that was the only way she could achieve what she needed. And just by giving that to her was, well, it just gave me my purpose was just there in front of me. It was wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. It's, there's there's a Jungian analyst uh, from Italy. His name is Lu- Luigi Zoya, and he wrote a book called uh, Addiction and Initiation. 
Yes. And his point that for many addicts, the problem is they're looking for transcendence and they make the mistake of looking for it in a pill or something you smoke or something you shoot up. And they're looking for that, that powerful experience yes. uh, and they can't find it. And sometimes just giving someone that option changes everything. Uh, in, the, in the language of neuroscience, one of the things that, that uh, we strive to do is to give people a, 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 an experience that is more salient. It is more craved than the drug experience. Uh, what drugs do is they work on the midbrain dopamine system, among others. And for some addicts, not all of them, but for some, the most important part is they can't even imagine something as good as drugs once they've had yeah. them. And the whole system gets biased to prefer drugs. And sometimes just giving them that option. Uh, I have a good friend up in New York State, had a woman who was an intractable alcoholic. She was, uh, her family was falling apart. She was able to do her duties uh, in the family uh, for the years, but she would always end the end of the day with a blackout. And nothing they could do in terms of standard treatment helped her. And uh, this person called me and said, what can we do? And I said, why don't you start off by teaching her how to anchor some positive affect? And and don't you know, are we still here? Hello? Yeah, yes, we're still here. Okay, I'm sorry. I hear <laughs> the Skype Skyping in the background. Um, oh. and, and don't you know, after a little practice with that, her her craving and her drinking stopped. Sometimes wow. it is very simple things like giving people, as you said, the resources that they need to do what they want to do or to feel the way they need to feel. Other people, it, it's got to be more than that. Uh, for some people, some recent research uh, focuses on the fact that, that many addicts have um, problems with their frontal uh, inhibitory circuits. That's the frontal lobe, uh, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate. And that, that those circuits can tend to be co-opted by drugs, and they don't, excuse me, get their fair share of uh, the neurotransmitters that, that would keep them functioning. Actually, the number of receptors decreases. And they found that mental exercise, mental exercise can help change that, getting people to think. And, and I take that as a validation of the submodality exercises. You learn to concentrate. You learn to focus your attention on feeling good. You learn to focus your attention on how good you can feel and where you want to be. That reawakens those circuits so that you can begin to make choices in other parts of your life. So, so there are all of these wonderful kinds of, of connections that I still see coming out of uh, neuroscience every time I look. It's it's an amazing field, and the more advances that are happening, and the more research, it just it opens up even more possibilities. Which we could just keep on talking. We could go on and on and on. It's it's um, yeah. an amazing field, and I, I can't believe we're we're coming towards the end, Richard. And I want to make sure that you know people know about you, how they can get in contact with you, um, your book, your work, and um, all your details for our listeners, please. Okay, well, um, my, uh, my website, the easy way to get to my website is tinyurl.com, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com, front slash Richard, Rick Gray, R-I-C-K-G-R-A-Y, and that will give you my website. You can, there are links on my front page to uh, get to my books. All of them can be downloaded for free uh, from the Lulu site. Download the PDF. If you want to buy hard copy, that's available there too. Uh, the other uh, web address is uh, richardmgray.home.comcast.net, but tiny URL will get there too. One more uh, is if you want to contact me, you can contact me at rmgray, G R A Y, 2012 at gmail.com. Brilliant, Richard. And thank you ever so much for joining me today. Your work is its wonderful. It empowers me in my job. And I'm just I look, looking forward to speaking to you again on a personal and professional level to learn even more. And thank you to all of our audience for tuning in today. If you'd like to learn more about NLP, then tune in each week and also visit my website, www.donnablinston.com, where you'll be able to pick up a copy of my best-selling book, Psychobabble. 
a straightforward plain English guide to the benefits of NLP. Also visit theorganicview.com and sign up for our newsletter, which will keep you updated with the up and coming shows, guests and online workshops. In the next live workshop, we will discuss how NLP can be used to improve your relationships, both personally and professionally, learning NLP techniques that will enable you to see events and problems from multiple perspectives and find out what is really important to you in a relationship. And once again, Art, thank you ever so much for joining me today. Oh, it's an incredible pleasure, Donna. I so appreciate what you're doing with your interview show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.